Hello, welcome to everyone who has joined us for our webinar today. I know people will continue to join and we really welcome those participating uh, from around the world today. Uh, my name is Dr. Rachel Vreeman. I am a pediatrician, a global health services researcher, um, someone who focuses on work related to children and adolescents growing up with HIV. And it's my very great privilege to be the chair of the Department of Global Health at the ICANN School of Medicine and the director of our Arnhold Institute for Global Health at Mount Sinai. Today, for our COVID and global health webinar series, we are going to be focusing around the topic of gendered violence in Nepal. As you may realize, um, it is the month of March and we are honoring Women's History Month this month. Last week, we celebrated International Women's Day and as part of what we want to be thinking about together during this period in March, we're really honored to be able to welcome Dr. Poonam Rishal with us today, joining us um, here to talk particularly about some of these issues related to gender and violence and what that has looked like in Nepal. Dr. Rishal is a medical doctor who also has a PhD in public health and a postdoctoral research position with the Norwegian University of Science and Technology in collaboration with the Kathmandu Medical College. She is a mixed methods researcher, which means she combines both quantitative data science as well as qualitative data, things like interview work and focus groups to really dig in in multiple ways around topics of gender and gender-based violence. For the last 13 years, she's engaged in interdisciplinary international research collaborations with work done across low, middle, and high-income country contexts. She's currently a co-investigator on a collaborative research initiative that focuses on healthcare's response to violence and to abuse, um, in which she's engaged with collaborators from the University of Bristol and Kathmandu University School of Medical Sciences. She's previously conducted randomized controlled trials and implementation research that's focused around this challenge of how do we improve care for those who've survived intimate partner violence and for for women, for girls, for members of the LGBTQI plus community and persons with disabilities. Um, we're really interested to hear about how she uses a gender-based analysis and framework in much of her work, as well as um, to we know her to be an excellent teacher who's developed coursework around gender and health and I personally am really excited to be learning from, from her today. So welcome, Dr. Rishal. We're really excited to have you with us. Um, and let me just say for those who've joined us, we're going to have um, a discussion today. I'm gonna to ask some questions, try to learn as much as I can from Dr. Rishal. We'll see how, where our conversation takes us. We'd like to give you the opportunity to ask questions as well. So if you think of questions or things come up, we do have a Q&A. Um, chat box set up, please feel free to type questions in and in the last part of our hour together, we'll turn to those questions and try to answer some that we haven't talked about already. So please feel free to type in questions at, at any time as you join here. We will also be uh, recording the session, so if you think of someone who um, you know, you'd like to share this with or you'd like to share this in some other context later, uh, please know that, that it will be here. Um, and it looks like we're maybe having some technical difficulties. So let's figure out what is happening with that a minute, because I definitely want to make sure that um, Dr. Rishal especially can hear us. Yeah. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now I can hear you. I, oh. I lost you for, for a while. Yeah, oh, sorry. I'm so sorry about that. No yeah. problem. I was just introducing. So you you missed the, the introduction yeah. to you, but we are very <laughs> excited to have you. And I'm so glad that things are, are working, mm -hmm. just as I wanted to um, mm -hmm. start asking questions. And I would like to note, you know, as we're honoring Women's History Month this month and really trying to consider together issues that do involve um, women as well as broader community of um, gender-based issues globally, 
um, that we're particularly excited to have you join us from your, your very rich experience in Nepal. As, as, as you know, and as um, some of those joining us know, at the Arnold Institute for Global Health, we have been trying to build up an equitable, long-term partnership with mm -hmm. partners in Nepal, particularly at the Kathmandu University School for Medical Sciences and the Dulakel Hospital System. We also have global partnerships that we're engaged in over the long term in Western Kenya, in Ghana, and also here in Queens, New York. And we really um, are excited to keep learning with our partners about how together we can advance gender equity and um, improve you know, health broadly in this way, but with a particular focus on what it looks like to move gender equity um, forward. So I, I think this is a particularly relevant topic as we consider that together and as we consider the specific context in Nepal as well. I wondered, Dr. Rochelle, if at, to begin our, our conversation, maybe you could set um, the stage for us, so to speak, with helping us to understand a bit more about what kinds of things we're considering when we talk about um, the idea of gendered violence, what that includes, and, and in that, what some of the um, questions and, and concerns your, your research has tried to focus on in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thank you, and it, it's it's really good to be here, actually, and to not just to learn from me, but but I also you know look forward to learn from you all, because it's a mutual learning process. I see. Um, so uh, when we talk about gender gender based violence, when the violence is gendered, means you know we're talking about violence against women, violence against men, violence against the different you know intersectionalities within men and women. And you know all the other communities like you know LGBTQ communities. So I so it is talking about intersections as well. So we're not leaving like anyone behind when we talk about gender-based violence. So so it's not just the women, but uh, but you know but by definition, um, gender-based violence is you know um, sort of tilted towards women because. Um, because um, women are the ones, you know, who, who face gender-based violence globally. Uh, they say like one in three women face uh, gender-based violence or any sort of violence from their intimate partner. So, so and, and also, you know, also for the reason that women are not safe at home because there are gang fights, you know, like men do, you know, um, men are part of gang fights or, or other, other disputes or conflict but you know when we talk about gender and why gender violence is gender towards women is because women are not safe at home so they may experience you know um, emotional violence which constitutes of various acts like um, you know scolding shouting ins insulting belittled and you know threatened um, so those are emotional violence and also physical violence and also sexual and sexual violence as well so uh, yeah but yeah, and even if we look at the statistics, the magnitude of the problem, women face more violence than men do. You know, and and with the with the changing context in Nepal, we we are also seeing that men do you know use oh, sorry women do use violence against their spouse you know who is a ma male or or you know other forms of violence as well. Mm -hmm. So so that is why you know that is why we talk about. So there, that's why, you know, although we see in researches that we use, you know, gender-based violence and violence against women interchangeably, but, but there is a difference between the be, these two concepts, actually. Mm -hmm. mm. You know, I think um, at times when, when we think mm -hmm. of gender-based violence or we think about violence against women, um, there is a tendency perhaps to think at a very individual level in terms of, you know, something that's specifically happening to an individual. Um, and even to think of, you know, these are specific events. I think sometimes, you know, re certainly recognizing, of course, the reality of violence happening in a home, but thinking of, mm -hmm. I think that even at times um, makes us think more narrowly that way as well, that it's it's this isolated thing. Could you maybe talk a bit more about how there are broader effects to this kind of gender-based violence, of how, 
how um, this kind of trauma or violence is not something that just affects and, and I don't mean that that is, you know, of course, minimizing it, but it's it's not only, you know, something that is mm -hmm. impacting physical safety for one person, for example, but that that can continue to have broader effects in other mm -hmm. parts of their life and in other parts of families and, and communities. Yeah, um, you know, before before even we before we talk about the consequences or impact violence mm -hmm. makes, I would I would like to, you know, like talk a little bit about the causes of violence the gender-based violence or violence against women mm -hmm. you know um, oftentimes you know like especially in Nepal I don't know what you know how people think about the causes in in the other parts of the world but especially when I have to you know just bring it to the context of Nepal you know every time we say that the women in rural area you know women who are not literate women who do not have income you know face violence or are vulnerable to violence or or you know men are men you know men use violence when they are drunk or whether they it's a substance abuse but <clears throat> but but you know the core cause is not education core cause is not economic core cause is not alcohol or any substance abuse but the core cause is the mindset, you know, the root cause, as we may say, the others are only contributing factors. Like, for instance, if I get drunk, I don't go and hit my husband, you know, it's the mindset, you know, because because here in this part of the world, women are considered weak. Mm -hmm. Women are considered like a subordinate. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the culture of marriage in itself, you know, where we, after getting married, have to leave our our you know natal home the home that we were born and brought up and then we have to go and resettle in our husband's house that mm -hmm. itself you know makes us in in a very uh, submissive position where we do not have a voice at all so so the power you know it, it's all about gender inequality you know how the women are raised because mm -hmm. if given a choice you know between a, a, a son and a daughter it's always prefer that the son gets a good education and and the daughter does not you know the, the gender inequality in that sense mm -hmm. the power where you know women are considered weak and the men men are considered powerful and also you know like and then there, there are different forms of power that interplays and then you know the patriarchal society where you know power lies within the male the masculinity you know the masculinity is so much <laughs> so much supported that it becomes toxic in a way so so these are the root causes actually and 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 you know most of our interventions are only you know looking into the causes mm -hmm. and i have you know in my in my work uh, during my phd i have found that women who were educated who earned money but who did not have autonomy to use their own income were you know three times at risk of violence so so it explains you know that that it's not only education or or you know economy but the root causes are completely different and 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 then coming to the consequences you know it not only impacts the physical health it not only impacts the sexual health it not only impacts the mental health but it impacts the the productivity of the woman mm -hmm. now in, in more than two you know before two decades or two three decades we were only talking uh, as you know only we are, we were only considering gender based violence or violence against women as human rights issue or violation of human rights mm -hmm. but you know after that it it really adds a burden to to this you know to the global burden of disease and if we think you know it, it it's really it is 9.5 the global burden of disease due to violence and rape is 9.5 years so you know women are losing 9.5 years of their productive life hmm. because once she's abused she has to stay home she has to you know the absenteeism you know increases she she cannot go she cannot face you know the, the mental health um, you know the trauma the stress level becomes so high that she cannot concentrate in her work so Mm -hmm. on the whole productivity is lost you know and then and then her social life is lost mm -hmm. and it also adds to the you know income burden you know burden of the country's gdp because you know more than 50 percent of any population is women and if the women cannot you know if the women cannot be in the forefront of you know earning or or you know income then the gdp of the country is lost so you know it it has impact right from an individual level to community and the country at large hmm. and yeah 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was I was just going to say I think it's so important that you took us um, back to the the systemic causes of this and mm -hmm. what just as you're saying that you know there there it's not these individual factors it's not oh this is associated with it and this and these things you know I know we like to look for things we can fix that way or identify as as risks mm -hmm. which isn't of course to say that there are not risks there but. Mm -hmm. Um, much as we, you know, increasingly are able to, you know, think of racism and other systemic forces that that create inequity. Um, certainly, the 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 framing of misogyny and the ways in which patriarchy mm -hmm. is is embedded at these different levels in in ways that um, you know not only affects. Um, everyone across those levels, but also becomes internalized both in our selves as humans, as well as into our institutions and our laws and the structures of, of, of how things are around us. It's, I, think, I just think that's so important to continue to bring forward that way, even, if, even as we think about you know, mm -hmm. um, individual impacts or, or how it moves forward. And then with that, um, you know, to realize just as you were starting to outline the many ways in which um, society then pays a price for those systemic inequities, that there is a real cost to that when you are removing such a substantial portion of your population from mm -hmm. the workforce or from full health and and life in that way not that it's it's not just what they might earn or do in that sense but but truly what um the impact of not allowing a segment to, and or you know potentially even a majority of your population to really um reach their full potential in terms of health and and wellness in that way so such such important points that way um you know when we then think about how we can promote the health of those who are you know trying to make a way for themselves um, mm -hmm. and women especially in um, contexts that have particularly um, uh, steep inequities for them and built into the, the culture around them. I know that you have looked some at, at healthcare settings and and what mm -hmm. um, the role that that healthcare might might play in this, both for better mm -hmm. and for worse. I would I would assume. Could you talk a bit about how um, you know how the healthcare system may be involved? Um, Again, you know, both perhaps the good <laughs> for good and and ways in which it can cause healthcare systems can cause more problems too when we think mm -hmm. about the issues of addressing uh, gendered violence. Yeah, no, uh, most of my work, you know, it's focused on healthcare and and both actually both, you know, because because healthcare has a role both in promoting uh, good health and also prevention mm -hmm. of violence in, in a way because. Because we are not just, because, you know, when we talk about violence or gender-based violence, we're not talking just about the wounds, the, the abrasions or lacerations or, or any other health effects that, that the survivor may come with, you know, because mm -hmm. this is something that is, you know, that, that does not, like I said earlier, that does not affect only individual, but it has an impact on the society at large, you know, including we now we are talking about you know intergenerational violence mm -hmm. because because it has impact on up till even like the children you know mm -hmm. the children or or it may last you know like for for years and years and the children may you know grow up with behavioral disorders so it, we're talking about intergenerational violence so so in that sense you know um I, I mostly work, uh, you know, I mostly use an approach called gender transformative approach mm -hmm. because, you know, till now what we, what we thought the healthcare providers could do was to identify and refer, mm -hmm. but, and, and also therapeutic not to miss. So, so the treatment part as a doctor, you know, like fixing the wound, um, you know, prescribing some um, medicine if the person is on stress, but that's not just enough. Because we, what we realized is that, you know, because 
even as a medical doctor, for example, you know, I am a part of this gendered socialization. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I may just give treatment and people may be, the survivor may be happy, mm -hmm. but you know, there is something that is missing. Mm -hmm. So, so even a healthcare provider, you know, in our role, we need to challenge our own gender socialization. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you know, I have heard people, you know, they would just fix the problem and then they would just go and talk to their friends and say, oh, look at the dress she's wearing. Look at how drunk she is. Don't you think, you know, if a girl walks in like that, she's going to be raped? Mm -hmm. So, you know, that person has not, all, although, you know, it is mandatory that you report rape, but but, you know, that person has not really challenged her own social norms and, and you know, empathized enough. So even identification, so therefore, identification and referral is not just enough because the women want more than that. You know, women want us to talk to their family members, for example. The only thing, you know, like most of the women, they only think that we should listen to, to, to them with empathy and, and you know, with non-judgmental attitudes. So what about us, you know, who are also socialized in this gendered culture? So, so I use a lot of, you know, reflective methodology, mm -hmm. the, the transformative approach, you know, where, where we are not just thinking about fixing the wounds, but we are also thinking about listening with empathy, you know, first line responding, listening with empathy, you know, inquiry, because I wouldn't, as a survivor, I wouldn't know if you are interested in listening to my experience. So inquiry they they wanted routine inquiry hmm. you know that i routinely inquired mm -hmm. so and then you know how do we ensure and enhance safety how do we listen to her without being judgmental or validate her experience you know not saying oh yeah it happens to all the women you know if only women could behave themselves but just to validate yes you don't deserve this you know this is something that you that no one deserves in life yeah. you know and then violence cannot there's no excuse to violence mm -hmm. so you know so we need that and then support referral because healthcare health sector is not just just the only you know a sector it mm -hmm. is it is about a multiple sector coming in together mm -hmm. so so we talk about so i work a lot in gender transformative approach and you know we we use a lot of that and and it has shown that when you start reflecting on you know on your own socialization and challenge the so social norms that you've grown up then when you respond to the woman the woman really feels that you know she's in safe hands hmm. so it's not just yeah i would just say like you know and then because just asking a, a woman mm -hmm. and you know like you know like bringing her stories mm -hmm. all her emotional outbursts is not ethical when we don't when we don't know how to support or when we don't support her sure sure so so that is that is a good and a bad you would say because women want something different from us and not just the treatment mm -hmm. and with that you know and then our role is to foster collaboration and coordination with other sectors because because what you know in my experience what i now we are talking like because because we are talking about a transformative approach mm -hmm. which means we're not just you know we're not just confined to equity. We're not just confined to equality, but you know, we have you know, gone past just equity and equality and thinking about justice. Mm -hmm. Because justice is different you know, and it is an individual perception. Because I work with, you know, I, I work with uh, women, uh, you know, rape survivors during conflict, you know, those 10 years of Maoist insurgency. And, and I remember one woman saying, you know, like, I'm not bothered whether the rapist gets jailed or bailed. I'm not bothered. Justice for me would mean when my son will come and tell and call me as his mother. That is justice for me. Hmm. Because, you know, the survivor has to go through a lot of, you know, a lot of trauma, a lot of stress, you know, and then a lot of stigma, discrimination when she discloses or someone comes to know that, she's a you know she's a survivor slashed victim mm -hmm. so you know justice is so important for these women and justice means so different so yeah so yeah the, you know it, it, it is a very you know it is a very complex phenomena because it's not like diabetes where you just get treatment 
but I see like, you know, we have, we have this uh, gender gap even in diabetes, but, but that is when I, you know, look, look through my gender analysis lens, but it's not like diabetes that you just prescribe someone and then, uh, you know, she's there, but this is something really, really complex, mm-hmm. I would say. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I think it's so, um, I think it's so important what you're describing in terms of this transformative approach and what that looks like for, mm. for healthcare in this way that in particular, that there's a starting place that's involved with looking inward and, you know, and mm-hmm. really in that sense, having transformation, doing work um, inward for the, the mm-hmm. wh- whoever might be involved in, in the healthcare um, for setting in that way first. And that that then is a, a critical part of what enables one to address um, the needs, the, both the needs of others immediately to ask questions mm-hmm. and listen with empathy and begin to yeah. really um, assess that, but then even to move beyond that for um, bringing about more justice within these systems as well, and not only mm-hmm. what it looks like for the individual, but bringing transformation more more broadly. I know, you know, as a physician, in so many ways, we too often are thinking just about how can we fix this thing that's in front of us. We want yeah. to, you know, many of us came to medicine wanting to help people and make things better in, in these ways. And um, to think about this framework of the work internally that needs to be done um, in terms of addressing these systemic challenges, how that actually can make you have more impact as an individual as well, yeah. but then what it looks like to move beyond that also in terms of having um, impact, uh, you know, systemically also in trying to counter that. So important. Thank you for for laying that out um, for me. That's really that's really useful. I wanted. I did want to ask you. Um, um, to tell us a little bit more about the specific context in, in Nepal. And, and I'm particularly interested myself as a pediatrician and one who um, for the last decade or, or so has especially been thinking about the issues of adolescence, of, of um, adolescents and young adults and what it looks like for, in that way, adolescent girls and, and young women in a particular context to to grow up healthy and supported and strong and how there is, I think, this critical window often where um, mm-hmm. you know we can see both a time where there are a lot of risks in what they're navigating and also if, if this these periods of adolescence can be navigated successfully, it can really, you know, set the individuals mm-hmm. on a trajectory for um, you know a lot of you know, you know different kinds of success and productivity and and full health in that way. I wondered, um, therefore, if you could maybe talk a little bit about what the specific context in Nepal is like for adolescent girls and young women, both in terms of you know some of the systemic challenges that they encounter and and you know maybe um, specific stories too about um, mm-hmm. you know where you see uh, needs that that need that should. Could be addressed uh, more effectively. No, well, actually, you know, um, I, I mean, the biggest challenge is, you know, biggest challenge is the, the difference in bringing up a girl and a boy child. Hmm. So there is, you know, I mean, things have changed, mm-hmm. but you know, and and when I'm like in trainings, you know, I I heard from a male, a young man, who just who said, you know. You, you talk about gender equality, inequality, and I don't see that there is inequality. Hmm. And I said, okay, like, why don't you see, because definitely we have, we have really moved from being unequal to, you know, being gender aware and also gender responsive in, in many cases. But, and then he said, you know, I'm educated and I'm married, I, I'll marry a girl who's educated. So how do you think we're unequal? Hmm. And then, you know, my question would be, okay, so can you please describe, you know, what your daily routine, the, the time that you wake up till you end your day? Mm-hmm. And then what is your wife's routine? Mm-hmm. So, you know, and then 
he started he doesn't have to do all household chores you know he can just think about his work mm-hmm. you know and then he he can just think about his education you know professional growth everything without any hassles mm-hmm. and w- the difference was that you know the wife had to wake up in the morning cook food for him for for herself pack lunch go to the office work in the office you know everything and then again come and give him tea serve him tea and all those things and i say okay do you see any difference now mm-hmm. you know here we as you know young women we are just set out for race you know we we start on the same line we have to go and finish on the same line but mm-hmm. the burden you know the burden we have to carry yeah and mm-hmm. then you know be a competitor it's completely different it's unequal in that sense you know so the biggest challenge already lies there and sadly whenever we are you know discussing gender mm-hmm. it is always ended up in you know the household chores whereas yeah. we should have really moved forward yeah and then you know yeah and then the government you know the government says okay the girls it's 33% rights to vote or 33% in the parliament Hmm. But I said, you know, if I'm born as a human, who are you to even tell me that, you know, I I have been given like 33% quota, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, so the upbringing in itself, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so, you know, the way we are brought up is completely different, you know, like, even, even my mom, mm-hmm. she always tells me, you know, what I should be doing as a woman. She mm-hmm. always told me what I should be go- doing as a girl, as a woman, as a mother. You know, mm-hmm. so there is some expected roles that we always have to, you know, confer mm-hmm. to. And we always have to prove ourselves mm-hmm. as a woman. You know, I think <laughs> there in itself lies the, lies the challenge in really, you know, uh, yeah, the challenge in growing as a girl and a woman in this society. Yeah. So, uh, so there is one. And then, you know, uh, the, the, the notion behind, you know, what a good girl should do. Mm-hmm. You know, a good girl confers to everything. A good girl, you know, obeys. A good girl does this and that. So, so, so you know, and, and there is a problem, you know, mm-hmm. when you define what is good and what is bad, because what if a girl you know, has premarital sexual relationship with a guy and she becomes pregnant. And it's not the guy who is to be cursed, but the woman is right. cursed to such an extent. Mm-hmm. And, then, and then the unmet needs of family planning, the unmet needs for sex, comprehensive sexual education, you know. Mm-hmm. So, so these are, I mean, these are the things that re- really shapes, you know, a person's upbringing and learning I think, you know, which, which is already a different and it's so unequal. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and yeah, just to add to this, you know, and I, you know, as a girl is always reminded that you're powerless, you're weak Hmm. Hmm. every time. Where, where do you think those messages, uh, at what levels do those messages come um, for girls? Mostly in the family? Is it heard more broadly yeah. across? Yeah, mostly family. Because of the societal pressure the family has to, you know, sure. the family has to live through. Because there is, that's why, you know, this, um, um, you know, socialization process is so important, you know, mm-hmm. where you, where you learn right from the beginning of what is, what is, what are the, mm-hmm. what do you say, like, what makes you a girl and what makes you a boy? Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, when we now, you know, coming to this stage, mm-hmm. after, you know, reading lots of literature, mm-hmm. now I know that gender is so fluid, you know, mm-hmm. I could have a masculine trait as a female, but I'm still a female. Mm-hmm. And it keeps on changing. You know, one day I like to become very feminine and the other day I like to become masculine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it, it comes from the parents. It comes from, it comes especially from the mo- mom because, you know, when we talk about power, you know, our moms have been power under, you know, under power, you know, so much so that when they have power in their hands, they, they start power, you know, 
using power over, which is a negative form of power. And it's not because it's not because of their socialization, but it's become it's because of you know the sub you know they have lived all through their life as subordinate. Yeah. Yes. And now they, they are given power. So you know, and then there is a tendency that you you know have this power over somebody and and yeah and and it is a girl child sure although and then people you know sadly people think okay we are giving you opportunity uh, to to study we are giving you opportunity to go abroad pursue your career but but you know when we talk about gender who who are even like parents who are they to just give me opportunity you know i i was born with that right to to be educated to be informed Hmm. to do things that I like, mm-hmm. to say I dislike this thing, to say that I don't want to get married at, in this age, to say that, you know, I, I want my own, I want to choose my own life partner. So I was born with that. So mm-hmm. so even as parents who are there to give me that, you know, opportunity and chances, I would say, I mean, it would may, it may sound very rude, but, but I, I hope you got the, you know, the, the notion behind this. No, absolutely. And I think it is important to to really think about how how deeply, as you're describing, that socialization goes and the many ways mm-hmm. in which it, it impacts um, from the very beginning the messages that that we all hear about about gender and about mm-hmm. what your possibility and your rights mm-hmm. are, even if these things yeah. are not um, even where they are not said in words explicitly, how it is framed and lived mm-hmm. out and um, what is opened up or not opened up in, in those ways as well. I think it's really important, as you're describing, to think about all of those levels of the, mm-hmm. the structures that we're, we're in in that way. I wondered, um, you know, we, we certainly have been hearing, I think, in this time of the COVID-19 pandemic, um about concerns that the both the constraints of lockdown but also the Mm -hmm. the economic pressures and the the tension in general that this has made um gender-based violence against women worse um in Mm -hmm. in particular um, I wondered whether this is um, something that you have seen any data for in Nepal or have been hearing about or any other ways in which you um, would like to, to help us understand how fully the, the pandemic has been challenging women in, in particular as well. Yeah, I mean, like many other instances, you know, um, we, we got, we had like, there were a few organizations like Women's Rehabilitation Center, the National Women Commission, and um, and also you know some of the helplines. You know uh, from from those data, um, you know counseling was uh, more than you know more than three three folds of what we used to get in in normal days, mm-hmm. and most of the most of the violence was domestic violence, mm-hmm. uh, and within that it was more of marital rape. Mm. and um yeah and then but but uh, surprisingly you know we we also got cases of violence against men especially you know post mortem in the forensic department mm-hmm. and in Duli Hill hospital you know um the forensic colleagues were saying that they get like two to three cases of violence against men and it's it is sodomy so so you know on examination mm-hmm. of the anal region they they saw Mm-hmm. suspicious you know suspicious suspicious injuries most likely due to you know rape uh, so so and and we also you know we also got like attempt to suicide among men maybe because of economic you know uh, recession and 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 the and the <laughs> you know the burden they have to carry of uh, taking care of the family but mostly it, it was domestic violence um, against women Mm-hmm. So, um, so, uh, so these organizations had, uh, you know, data like mostly more than sixty uh, percent of all the violence cases were domestic violence against women. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, and I, yeah. I think I too have been seeing increasingly um, data that are really sobering, not only about these, you know, the, these very, um, you know, 
clear in those ways violence um, being done, mm -hmm. you know, physically, um, at, you know, and, and including sexually and emotionally, of course, to women, but also the ways in which some of those um, systemic mm -hmm. inequities that you've been describing have been made worse as well. You know, thinking about looking, I know from the United States, looking at the figures of women who have left the workforce um, and mm -hmm. the particular uh, demands of childcare, which have felt per, you know quite impossible at times with, you know, when, um, especially, um, you know, when there have been limitations on what's available for child care outside of the home or for having um, help within the home, seeing how, how much women have borne of that. In fact, you know, even myself as a parent of a young child, um, even with a, a lot of privilege that I would recognize in that, it has often felt fairly impossible when schools are closed and, and child care is, is not available that way. And I, I, um, I think that it has been, you know, and especially with concerns about the health of young children, um, how to keep them safe, but also how to, you know, also manage uh, work is, is a major, a major challenge. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think it's, I think it's really telling that those I, I think it just shows so quickly how already the vulnerabilities and the inequities in our society, as soon as there is an additional force like this, you see yeah. those those um, inequities even even greater um, or or the violence done in those ways really increasing as as well. Yeah, um, yeah, and that is why that is why you know that is why we you know we are a group of researchers who work on transformative approaches. That's why we say that, you know, I mean, uh, there, no violence may be a utopian, you know, we, we may be imagining like it's an utopian world, mm -hmm. but, but, you know, when we think about or when we, you know, reflect on our own actions, you know, mm -hmm. then, you know, we, we, we think about how do we balance power? How do we, you know, go towards gender equality? You know, how do we really you know, um, think about not being, you know, patriarchal or, you know, not showing power over someone, you know, so that's why, you know, that's why we use a lot of transformative approaches in, in, in this as well, because we also, we as health, because, because I have been a healthcare provider and I have reflected enough, you know, how I worked and, and the way we are trained, like step one, do this, step two, do this, you know, how we are, you know, trained as a medical doctor to fix things. But then, you know, this is not just about fixing things, you know, it's about reflecting your own act. So I have also learned and reflected my own action towards the, the maybe uh, women survivors that I, I may have missed, you know, and then reflective, reflected upon my own actions and, you know, try to, try to, you know, work on that. And, and, and then you, you see like, oh, okay, so she has been through a lot of experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so yeah, it's, I'm also talking from my own experience of, you know, working with issues as a medical doctor and then, you know, transitioning to, to a researcher or case manager, mm -hmm. trainer, yeah. I had a question for you as a researcher in, in that sense about um, gender data um, and the, the idea of, you know, that we um, too often <laughs> our data, whether it's for, you know, what we understand about the human body or how a medication works or um, other phenomena in in the world, you know, very often, as, as you well know, most of these data are collected um, and, and based on men, um, yeah. you know, in terms of how medication, you know, research around drug development, for example, but yeah. but really, you know, looking all the way back in, in terms of our medical education and systems and for, you know, so many, many, many years, um, so much of what we know is really largely based around um, data from from male bodies in, in this way or, or from, as well as from uh, male researchers. I wondered, you know, but I think we also, though, as scientists tend to think like data are data. <laughs> they're, they're, yeah. they're not that. Could, so could you could you talk perhaps a little bit about 
why thinking of gendered data are, are critical for research and where we might particularly, you know, have some priorities for addressing those gaps in terms of where our data come from and, and who is engaged in research in that way as well? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I mean, until and unless proved otherwise, anything would be assumption, you know, as a researcher. So we are testing those assumptions. So, you know, we have, you know, during data collection, we have to see and try to, you know, incorporate, um, you know, this data segregation, not just in terms of men and women, but mm -hmm. also, you know, in terms of LGBTQIA community. Mm -hmm. Because now we are talking about, you know, inclusion. We're not, we're, it's not like, you know, we're, we're not talking about, you know, I don't like to call them like gender and sexual minority, minority as they are referred in, in our constitution, you know, mm -hmm. because they are also human. So who are we to categorize them yes. in that sense? So, so, you know, just be mindful of, you know, including any, any gender into mm -hmm. your data would be one of the solution because and rightly right, you know you have rightly pointed that we only look into like let's say in the heart surgery you know uh, central chest pain you know constricted chest pain you know radiating to jaw are symptoms you know based on what men have complained we don't i mean women may not i haven't heard you know women complain about central chest pain or jaw pain you know most of the most likely they forget they are so engrossed in their household work that they don't even feel that pain mm. you know and 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 i know one of my friend lost his mother because they were treating her for epigastric pain and for gastritis yeah. which was actually you know a heart attack a cardiac arrest in that sense so you know most of these symptoms have been established you know, on the basis of what men have been through. So there's all already, you know, this lopsided or biasness towards, you know, doing research and including men. Like for instance, even lung cancer, women smoke too. So we are also vulnerable, you know, to lung cancer or, you know, we are also vulnerable to pollution, polluted air and everything. So, so you know, we, we are also, but, but, but in, in studies related to lung cancer, it's mostly based on men. Mm -hmm. And and also like you know even like women's health you know we we exclude our uh, you know lesbian population the bisexual women population trans women so we're missing out on so many different people here you know so and 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 that is why I think now I've given up quantitative I've given up randomized control trial it doesn't interest me so much because I really like to understand the phenomena that's why I you know transitioned into a mixed method researcher because sure. it gives me a balance of you know the numbers and also the why the wh and how questions you know that that a research should uh, should address yeah like not only in treatment I would say you know when we talk about quality of care we don't ask, we use the same tool, same questionnaire for both men and women. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then we base on those data and say like quality of care was perceived poor among women and men. Mm -hmm. You know, we forget the fact that we reproduce and, you know, we have other health issues Absolutely. and even like, yeah, and health literacy, health counseling, you know, a, a, a husband, a husband who has diabetes, you know, a woman her wife will be called and, you know, counseled for proper diet and what a nutritious diet would look like. But a husband is never called, you know, when a wife is diagnosed to have diabetes and say, okay, now you have to take care of your wife, you know, like you have to take care of a diet. This is the calorie. She's, you know, we don't say that as a doctor because we, we only, you know, we abide by the notion of just, we only know two sex that is men and women we know two gender that is masculine and feminine, but sadly, you know, sex and gender is so fluid. Sure, sure. No, I think I think this is such an important point, both in terms of the specifics and really understanding that we must not make these assumptions that we that that data um, do not. Uh, you know, it's it's interesting. I've heard uh, qualitative data referred to as data with a soul. I think meaning <laughs> that it starts to you know get at these phenomenon and and more of this this context of of what is really 
um, there and and the individuals involved mm -hmm. in in this way and um, but it's also a good reminder as we approach quantitative data too that that if we're neglecting or, or don't have enough understanding uh, or have kind of cut off the data from all of that context that that in many ways is the is the soul or are the soul of the data in that way that that we miss we miss things and that if we assume that data you know exclusively really from one particular group can be applicable across across the the gender spectrum across the age spectrum i often have this with um, you know what we understand um, in terms of children, where we make as you know guesses and assumptions based on what we know about adults. That too often we are are wrong, or we we, we cannot make those assumptions. I, I appreciate too your important reminders mixed throughout there that um, uh, I guess in the sense that this is the, uh, our. Any gains we make for equity in this from a gender perspective must include everyone, that, that we are also doing mm -hmm. a disservice um, if, if, if you know, we, if we cut, even if, you know, we, we think we are moving forward, say, uh, women's issues in this very particular way, if we are not including in that the liberation and increased equity for, um, you know, the much, much broader community of, of human beings, um, that are that are engaged with that as well. So such such important points there that it's not limited. I know we're approaching the end of our hour together. We um, and would again welcome um, anyone listening with us uh, to uh, get sent, you know type in questions in the box if if you would like. We do have um, a question there that I think is quite um, interesting, um, and I know you're not only a researcher, Dr. Rochelle, but an, an educator mm -hmm. as well. And I think this is an area where we could really use some some thoughts both on transformation and education in this way. So the, the question um, describes that, you know, there are many women who, for example, have experienced sexual assault or other forms of, of violence who, for an outside observer, may appear to be very successful, doing well, for example, doctors who are women. Um, but, but yet these experiences of violence, of course, may still be impacting their productivity and all the ways that, that you were describing that, that violence um, can. And yet due to the stigma associated with these events or associated with um, a sexual assault or, or experiencing violence, that you know these these people may feel that they have to hide their experiences from others at work they might accept that they you know they are not able to offer these events as an explanation for lost productivity at work so the question is you know what are your thoughts on how we might create work environments that um would in in better support those who have experienced or are experiencing gender-based violence and bring about change to this idea that discussing things along these lines with superiors with managers and so on um, is unprofessional how might we counter that do you think mm -hmm. yeah i mean yeah uh, you know going back to basics again you know it's the way I am looked into as a woman, you know, or looked down upon, or, you know, the favorable place, you know, even like these days, workplace provides or, you know, is, is a favorable place where even a career woman like us, you know, who's high in society, you know, they are, they are sexually exploited. We experience sexual violence, you know, so, so, I mean, this is a favorable favorable place that's why you know that's why you know going back to basics I always talk about you know the power because rape is not a cause and consequences of power imbalance you know it is a cause and consequences of how I as a woman is looked into because the mm -hmm. way men are taught you know to to look at women in mm -hmm. in, in a different sense you know like like someone in a weird in in this planet you know or mm -hmm. someone who is weaker than me myself and you know though because even I have been through you know this character assassination when people cannot put me down with their intelligence you know they they try to seek for places where which is you know which which helps them to 
assassin my character in that sense so you know i have been a victim of that as well so i i really feel that you know we have to have this gender policy in place otherwise you know we we wouldn't know what our you know what are the legal provisions what we need to do where because a gender policy you know if we if a, every organization has a gender policy then within that gender policy it is defined that you know there there should be a safe workplace for women mm -hmm. there should be somewhere you know a committee that that a woman can go and file her case the mm -hmm. committee that looks into you know her case the committee that really feels for her so so we 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 talk about survivor centered approach you know it is basically like like she has the rights to complain she has the rights to information she has the rights to you know get justice and and you know the the perpetrator or the offender uh, you know has to be held accountable for for whatever he has done because you know gender based violence does not only affect women it affects men too because you know the socialization process where a man has to conform to all the you know notions that make him a mature man or make him a real man is you know within this society and then therefore you know to become a real man he has to ab abide by all the the masculinity notions you know so we call it hegemonic masculinity so so we have to he he hold him accountable as well you know we have to we have to talk to that man because the society has provided him with power to to make the women weak to to look like that you know to to sexually assault a woman hmm. it is in his gender socialization so one of my work you know now the recent work that i've started is you know i'm interviewing prison inmates of why they used you know violence and what are the different approaches that we could used to support them to rehabilitate them during their prison sentence you know so that they become a human not a real man but a human when they come out so you know there has to be a gender policy within the institution first and then the institute and then the gender policy should spell out these these things that there should be a safe place for a woman uh, within the, within I, i don't know if i've answered but but still yeah. you know we need to yeah even even at dolikil hospital you know we have started this process you know we have this we have we have had rounds of focus group discussions with the health managers and and then you know i i looked into the policy so so we are doing this you know gender policy within the institution and every institution should have everyone should be a signatory sure so I, I, so yeah Yeah, and I think, you know, I think it is important to really consider in these ways, you know, the role that not only individuals can play, but how structurally in terms of policies, the, the, um, the you know, the framework of the organization and, and so on are really able in this, in this mm -hmm. way to, to also be protective and, and be a foundation for how we might create better communities in this way as well. There's, I think, um, maybe this will be the last um, question we have time for, but an, an interesting question as well about um, what led you into this work and what advice you might have for those who are interested in prepare in also pursuing this kind of both research or community and engagement. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to kind of hear a bit about that and perhaps as you think about the future um, of your work, um in in terms of countering violence in these ways um perhaps what words of encouragement you might have for those who are also yeah. considering a path like this going forward yeah actually you know i think um research you know my interest for research you know led me to this work because actually i went to went on to do masters in international community health in at University of Oslo and I was thinking of looking into an association between uh, you know nutrition during pregnancy and childbirth mm -hmm. you know and then impact on the child so um so one of you know every time you know I was working with the variable mm -hmm. I came into this uh, you know this variable access to healthcare access mm -hmm. to you know food mm -hmm. access to you know like um, deprivation of food which is a whole chunk of you know a form of gender based violence so sure. i think my journey on uh, working with violence started from this variable 
Mm. So, <laughs> so, so that is how. And then once I, you know, um, set into this, then I, I became very passionate about the issue and, and, you know, like quality of care, the women survivor gets from healthcare uh, providers and, and which became my PhD. And, and I, you know, this is how I started my work. So I think one needs to be very passionate because there is a lot of threat in this work. You know, I get a lot of threat there is fear, you know, there is anxiety in this work because when you can't do, and you know, sometimes you just become hopeless that you can't fix things because we as human, we have this nature of fixing things. And when women don't go to places or don't agree to, you know, go to places where we have referred to, then there is this hopelessness that comes. So it's, it's a package of emotions you know when when you start on with this work but it is rewarding as well not just for you to grow and reflect on your own but but also to you know make a just society because not we because you know it's not only enough to be equal it it has to be just mm. you know because we are we are like breaking barriers of this in, 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 inequity inequality you know so so there is, and, 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 you know, one of the other things that's important is, you know, you have to collaborate. Mm -hmm. You have to collaborate, not just with the NGOs or UN agency or any research, but you have to col collaborate with the women themselves, you know, the survivors themselves to, to really know and to, to you know, to, to be with them, to put yourself in, in her shoes, in their shoes, you know just to know what she or that particular person wants you know so so you have to collaborate and and foster this collaboration and coordination with the survivors themselves then only you know you'll, you'll get to know what what these people really want and how you can work on on issues like these so it's it, the, these are very important um, you know things i think these are ingredients and spices that adds to your work because, you know, I mean, you know, I, I had set out, you know, we, we say it in Nepali, you know, uh, it's Nepali, but I'm, I'm daring to translate it. So, so there's a song that says, you know, don't drown yourself deep into the ocean unless and until you think that you'll get a pearl. You, you are hunting for pearl and you take out that pearl. So, so, you know, I've already set myself into finding those pearls mm -hmm. and, and getting out. So I've really dived in deep uh, and it's my passion uh, and it's my passion for a just society that that really drives me and and collaborations and you know all those things apart from that and uh, um, so th so this is it and and you know we need uh, we need collaboration from researchers worldwide and the other thing is that you have to continuously grow in terms of knowledge you know I started with just looking at prevalence but now I'm thinking about transformative approaches and and the intervention has to focus both women and men, because sure. for a just society, you know, we need a balance or, you know, by man, man, man and woman, I mean, like, you know, you need both the partners to mm -hmm. be more precise, you know, and be inclusive. So we need to work with both, both the parties, Absolutely. not just one. Yeah. That makes so much sense. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Poonam Rochelle, for being with us today. Thank you for your passion. Thank you for all of your work in this field over these years and for helping to teach us about that today. And thank you especially for teaching us and reminding us that we are not just working for equality or equity, but we are working for justice. We really, we appreciate your voice today. Thank you so much. Thanks to everyone who joined us. And again, we will um, be posting a recording of our discussion that we would welcome you to share as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I really enjoyed, yeah. Excellent, thank you. Yeah.